Hey, it's Bass Quest. Welcome back to another complete guide video. Today we're going to be talking about targeting big fish in swift water. Now, specifically talking about fishing tail races, fishing below dams, and a lot of current, but this is also going to be applicable to ledge fishing. So, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, they're going to be applicable on these other videos that we do down the road. So, don't click away if you're not interested in getting below the dams over there. We're going to do like we do in a lot of these videos. We're going to start out, do some fish catches. We're going to work our way into talking about the techniques themselves, and then eventually we're going to get into finally the map study at the end of the video. We're going to break down some key areas, how you can actually find these areas in advance and catch those fish. But without further ado, let's jump into some fish catches. God. Oh, you scared the bird. Nice. Good <laughs> Right? <laughs> oh, golly. <laughs> Angry Eddie. Green fish. Oh, oh man. You got teeth on that one. <laughs> I'm telling you. All right. There she goes. Three pounder. Junkerton. Yeah. Another good one, boys. Little river fish. Yep, just gotta kind of control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I got the boat, I got the boat. Bass fish. Should we just... Eh, it's a little small for an Instagram picture. Yeah. Pretty though. Another one. I mean, right off the bank. Four pounder. This is just plain old fun right here. Mm. Yep. Come on. Ah, slam. Grand slam. Slam. Nobody wants to stay with it, though. I meant to. Nice. Big. Big. <laughs> fumbled. <be>. Fumbled. <laughs> oh, Chris. You pulled it out of the Chris. net. You pulled him out of oh, the net. Oh, no, there's no way that's going down on me right there. I'm you telling him out you. Of the net. What a fumble. <laughs> oh my god. Ooh, ooh, giant. Big old brownie. I made a good Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Golly. I mean a meaning. Oh, bass attitude. one right there. I can get a hold of my handle. Golly, big and big and I mean a flat out giant, probably a mega drum. It's got to be a drum. Got to be. Coming up. <laughs> Freaking nailed it, dude. They're going to be in all these little cuts, ain't they? Look at that. Put the pink nightmare on them. Right there, Get that pink nightmare down there. Oh. <laughs> That's a big one. That's a big one. Look at the build on that fish, boy. Get in that water. Go. 
We're gonna have to drift right down through that little thing again. I mean, oh, dude, that's awesome. Nom, man. nom, nom. Dude, that's bigger than a six pounder. There you go. Boys, every that's bit of five and a half, six. Here. I mean, a giant. All right, hope you're still with me so far. Hope you enjoyed those fish catchers. I try to put a variety of different fish catchers from multiple days, multiple techniques in there so you can kind of get the gist of what I'm talking about. Now we're gonna jump into the teaching part of the video, so stay tuned, let's hop into it. All right, first and foremost here, I wanna say, especially when you're fishing tail races, when you have a lot of current, whenever those floodgates are open, high water, um, a lot of current can mean dangerous conditions. So if you're not adept or if you haven't fished like this a lot in the past, you don't have a lot of experience, you need all your gear in really good repair, you need a, a very reliable outboard you need reliable trolling motors all your batteries need to be up to date everything on your boat needs to be functioning perfectly this is not a, a technique or a style of fishing that you just you know unwinterize a boat hop out and do this is something that you need a tested vessel so you can get out there and do this safely life jackets keep them on have a buddy in the boat with you at all times Keep the motor running on the first few drifts until you're very comfortable with those drifts because you can get in trouble with the trolling motor and that current can push you under things or do things to you that you're not used to doing. So all things that are important. Now after that little disclaimer, let's jump into it. All right, point number two when we're talking about tail race fishing, guys. This is quality fishing. You catch big fish all year round doing this. And the reason is, when that water is coming out of spillways, when it's coming through turbines, it gets oxygenated. Also, a lot of times they're pulling water from the lower part of the basin above or the reservoir above where this water is coming out. So what happens is you got a tight area, a lot of current coming out, and it's water that's coming from deep. So what happens is you have water that's a very stable temperature year round as well. In other words, it's not as affected by cold. Cold front. It's not as affected by really cold weather, really hot weather. These fish have a stable environment and what happens is the bait and the predator fish are able to thrive year-round in this environment. Now point number three is that I would tell you to get very acquainted with your home body of water and what I'm referring to there as the dam pushes out more water it not only raises the amount or increases the amount of current that's acting upon the water below in the tail race but it will also raise the water level. You can look a lot of times, I'll probably flash here the TVA app for us we can look and see how much they're generating in other words how much water is flowing there into that tail race and by that I can gauge just on my local knowledge where that water level is going to be where the eddy lines current seams are going to be that I want to target those fish in and that really helps me break down the body of water before I even get there so I'm not surprised point number four just like we talked about in the beginning these techniques as far as how you fish swift water they also apply to how you fish other parts of your river so and use those up on Chickamauga I can use them on Watts Bar I can use them further down in Nickajack where the lake widens out and there's less current impact and you can visually see it when you're in that swift water I think that's why it really helps which feeds into our next point so point number five, learn how to visually read the river. And one of the best ways to do this and probably one of the most helpful things you can do is to get out and fish some small creeks. Most of the people around here, we have access to small trout streams, little streams that have smallmouth bass, maybe Kentucky spotted bass in them. So these heavy current, clear little bodies of water, you can really see how that water is acting on different points of cover or structure in the water. So maybe there's a small bar there. You can see how that current's interacting with their cut that's causing an eddy, a big boulder, how the water is, is moving over. And in the clear water, oftentimes you can actually see those fish. You can see bait and how they position in those areas. And again, the more you can visualize, I feel like that helps you when you get out in 25 foot of water, you're ledge fishing, you're trying to, to understand how they're setting up on the ledge, where they should be setting up, and things like that. So all this is going to work together to hopefully make us a better fisherman, right? Point number seven, the fish will stack up. So the the more current you have, the smaller the areas that these fish can comfortably sit, that they can comfortably ambush bait, there's smaller areas that bait themselves can be confined into. So what will happen is you get piles and piles of fish into these areas. And so when you're fishing, it leads into the next point, point number eight, fish fast. Cover water, fish high percentage areas, and as soon as you get bit, if you can't hold, you know, if you get a bite and you can't turn the troll motor and just hold in that area and really fish it, make sure you drift that area again. You might have to drift it multiple times to really get all the goody out of that area but some of the best times I've had I've been in really high water um, really swift water and drifting catching a fish off an area going right back and doing the same drift over and over and catching multiple big fish off the same spot and oftentimes it's a really small spot all right number 10 the baits we're gonna start at the top and work our way down 
Some of the baits I really like to use are big walking baits. I feel like something that draws a lot of noise, something that I can kind of keep in the same area, I can keep it in that current seam, can be really effective. Walking a popper is another really good technique. Buzz baits are other good baits that I use for top water when I'm fishing river systems, but I want something that I can cast accurately for one or make bomb casts with when I'm fishing open water in the rivers. And I, I need to be able to retrieve that bait in a way that I can kind of keep it in the strike zone. In other words, around wherever those fish are gonna be because a lot of times it's not your full cast unless you can line up on the spot correctly. One of the other baits that I really enjoy using on a river system is a jerk bait. So this, I've got a Vision 110 here that's all eaten up that I've used for years and years. A Rapala X wrap or shadow wrap, I should say. Any kind of um, floating or suspending jerk bait can be absolutely wonderful when you're fishing in the river. And again, it's something that you can keep, you know, when I throw that jerk bait out there, I can get it down and then I can jerk it in place and leave it there. I can suspend it and leave it and let it drift. And that's a, a lot of times, if you like to trout fish a lot, you know being able to have something like a, you know, a road runner or um, a rooster tail where you can kind of keep it and let it go parallel to you and move down that current and you can control where it hits. Whatever you're trying to hit is very important. So jerk bait can be fantastic for that. You can throw upstream and work it directly to whatever you're trying to catch that fish off of. All right, another bait that I like to use a little bit lower in the water column but still relatively shallow is a square bill. Um, this is a Excite Baits square bill here. It's got a weight transfer system. I'm really liking their original square bill right there. It's got good colors, good hooks, good hardware and things like that. But anyway, that uh, square bill, it stays higher in the water column. You can throw it right around lay downs. You don't have to worry about getting hung up as much. It's a, it's a very accurate bait. So if you're fishing around man-made structures such as docks or pylons or, or any kind of you know big metal structures that they put up there, it can be fantastic. It also stays high in the water column so you can expect to get bites actually out from the bank. In a river system, it's funny, it doesn't seem like you have to deflect off of things as often as you do and when you're fishing the lake itself so a lot of times what you'll see me is when I'm retrieving even the shallow crankbait back to the boat I'll stop it give it a couple pops reel it again give it a couple pops and that'll actually a lot of times trigger fish that follow this bait out moving a little bit deeper in the water column I really like to use a swim bait it can be something like this really small you know something lightweight really finessey you can also go bigger five six inch seven inch big bastrick style hollow body swim baits on a little bit heavier heads are important as well but again I don't really like to fish these on the bottom I want to get a weight that I can keep higher in the water column I can move relatively quickly that seems to be the ticket. Another one is an underspin. So again, taking a small Kitek style bait, sticking it on the back of that underspin there. This is a hog farmer. I think it's called the War Pig. I really love this underspin that Scott's come up with there. That's a great bait. Now working our way down a little bit more, one of my favorites, and you'll see, you probably saw footage of this when we did fish catches earlier, but a small body crankbait. This is a Bandit 300, you know, runs maybe 10 feet or so. Bandit 200, similar to a DT6, which is another a great bait. Bandit 200 here, this thing runs six feet or so. Really small body presentation though seems to be the ticket on that. And then a medium sized bait like that DT6 is fantastic as well. Here's another one for you. Probably my all time favorite is the Storm Wiggle Warp. And I've got it in a couple key colors here. Uh, you'll notice a lot of bright, vibrant colors. You know, a lot of times it's not trying to be the most natural thing. It's something that you're really buzzing it through there. You're moving water, you're covering water with that bait and it's a reaction bite that you're getting out of those fish. A lot of times these river fish, you know, with that current pushing that bait through there, they don't have a lot of time to make a decision on whether they're going to eat something or not. So more often than not, if the right kind of profile gets through there, they'll tag that thing just to see what it is. All right, now working our way all the way to the bottom, there's one that you can't hardly beat, and that is the jig. This is an MDC custom tackle jig, the sniper jig here. I like their full size sniper jig but I'm really liking this mini mag flipping jig right here. And I trim it up, you know, he's got a full size skirt on there to begin with, but I trim this down. You can see heavy hook, but small hook, very compact bait. And for some reason, when you get in the river system, these finesse jigs are the money for me. I don't throw it a full size jig as often when I'm down in the river and I catch huge fish on these things, the little finesse jigs like this. It's just it's something about it, the fish really key in on that. It looks like a bluegill, it looks like a craw. And again, it's something you cover water with it. You're moving through there. And I target largemouth with it a lot. So when you're fishing these river systems, you got swift water running down, but you also have these cut-ins. And on the cut-ins, you have slack water. And that's where a lot of times largemouth will like to set, especially if the water's pushed up, they'll be in the bushes, they'll be in the lay downs in there. You can go through 
with this little jig and really mop up and catch a big limit of largemouth, even on a you know, body of water that's known for smallmouth, we'll say it that way. All right, finally, I don't have one rigged up right now, but a drop shot. And I'm gonna do a video, a separate video, talking about extreme current fishing with a drop shot, how to keep from hanging up, because that's one thing that's extremely annoying now that we're talking about lures that can technically hit the bottom. You know, I don't use a football jig when I'm fishing the tail race very often at all, because they'll get hung up so much, it's such a pain, and you lose so many of them that, I, you know, if I'm gonna use a jig, I'm just gonna be flipping it. Don't use a shaky head that much down there. I do like to use um, this lightweight Ned head that Scott's got right here, and I'll put that, one of these on here. It's a little pintail shad. This Ned head with that little pintail on there is absolute money. You can see he's got a very unique shape to it. It's almost a sled shape, and what happens is you can just pull that thing along, and it's kind of like one of those Strike King jid heads. It'll keep from getting stuck, or you can easily pop it out of a lot of tight spaces that you can't get a lot of other lures out of. I like to use that. I like to use a drop shot with a specific technique that we'll talk about later. And that's pretty much it for my lineup. You know, it's it's really simple. River fishing, you five or six, seven rods on deck with a few different varieties of baits on them and you just cover water. Another one I didn't show for you here is that advantage tackle spinner bait. I'm gonna flash a picture up there for you. It's an absolutely awesome bait. It has a really unique vibration to it, um, a more flexible arm to it. It seems like it really gets those fish keyed in. It's outfished a lot of other spinner baits for me um, recently, so y'all be sure to check those out as well. There'll be a link down. Okay, number 11, really fast, we're gonna go over some of the combos that I like to use. And I think the main thing that you need to understand when I'm river fishing, getting under trees, I'm getting around lay downs, man-made structure, and I'm moving very quickly. So the name of the game is short, accurate cast. So one thing that's probably popping into your head, pops into my head immediately, is I want a shorter rod. On average, when I'm fishing down at the river, everything I use is, is sized down from the line itself. So a lot of times, instead of flipping with 20 pound test or 18 pound test, I'm gonna do it with 50, 15, 14, um, 16 pound test line. I use that K9 100% fluorocarbon. Absolutely awesome stuff when I'm flipping down there. But again, lose BB1, BB Pro, seven to gear ratio, maybe an eight gear ratio. Sometimes I'll break out one of my super duties and run an eight gear ratio. But I like 100% fluorocarbon. I like a shorter rod. This is a 7.3 medium heavy action rod, fast action. That's gonna throw my jigs. It's gonna throw a lot of my smaller swim bait. Um, I'll even throw some of my top waters on that. Typically, when my top waters, I'll use a short frog rod. So a 7.2 frog rod. It's got a little bit more moderate bend. It's designed to be throwing hollow body swim baits and frogs. That's a perfect rod for that application. As always, when we're talking about fishing, the smaller stuff like the mid-range crankbaits, those small body crankbaits. And when we're talking about doing the jerk bait, it's always on the same combo. I use a little seven foot. It's a medium heavy, but it's a moderate action rod. It's very moderate too. It's got a lot of tip and it allows me to load up on those fish. I use light line. Most of the time, 10 to 12 pound test I'm gonna use down there with my jerk baits and with my mid-range crankbaits like we saw before. My square bills, I go a little higher. What I'll do is I'll go to a seven foot, medium heavy, fast action rod. And what this is, it's just an all-purpose rod. I'll throw for anywhere from some of the, the shaky heads themselves, anywhere with that 12 to 14 pound test range. One of my favorites is this Lose Team Light right here. It's a six, four to one gear ratio, I believe, but just something I can use a lot of different techniques on. I can use for my moving techniques, you know, like my jerk baits, my crank baits. I can use it for spinner bait fishing. And in a pinch, I can still throw that thing out there and have enough gear ratio to get behind a fish on a jig. Gotta have a spin rod on you at all times down there it's gonna fish your little net heads it's gonna fish your little poppers a lot of times I throw on that spinning rod sometimes a small jerk bait or a small floating jerk bait I'll throw but that's it for combos thanks for sticking with me to this point now we're finally gonna jump into probably my favorite part and what everyone seems to like the most that's the map study so let's pop into that now welcome to the map study we're gonna break down Nick and Jack tail race so you see here we've got the dam I'm gonna zoom in a little bit we've got a wing wall that comes out we've got this structure they've been building for forever for the lock got a bridge here but we can also also look at some of these contour lines. Now some of it's restricted so they don't have all the little details on the contours and things like that, but we can see a lot of things that are important to us right off the bat. Now one of the first things and probably one of the most important things when you're river fishing as far as a current break is going to be an eddy. So what creates an eddy? 
Now, typically, it's some kind of main lake structure. Now, when I'm talking about structure, I'm talking about like right here, you can see there's a hump. This is actually a rock pile right here. Um, anytime you've got this wing wall where it comes out, there's a wing wall down here by the dam itself as well. So anytime you got a wing wall, that current peels out and goes, it gets pushed around that. And so what happens, you have a current break and you've got an eddy swirl as well where that water. Now, these are fantastic areas where you still got moving water, but it's also, it's got slack water in the middle of it where these fish can sit. They can sit on the edge of it and kind of surf it and wait for that bait to get pushed to them. Now, what are we talking about when we're talking about slack water? So if we zoom in here, say the current's coming out, here's your spillways. Ooh, zoom in a little bit. There's your spillways right here. And here's your turbines over here. So you've got your current is coming down through here. There's very little current that comes out of this creek or the lock on the upper portion of the screen there. So as that current comes down, it's gonna interact with this wing wall and then it's gonna continue on down and then eventually intersect with the bank down here somewhere as well. So any of this water back up in here, it's gonna be slack water. I'll have very little current a lot of times no current and that's where a lot of your lethargic your non-active fish will tend to sit or in times when you've got extreme high water extreme current that might be where everything is sitting so you really have to know your body water like we talked about in the beginning understand how different water levels affect the the movement of the fish so to speak now let's talk about now let's talk about current seams a current seam is any place where something juts out or, or protrudes and stops the current or, or impedes on on the current itself and these are really important because a lot of times fish hang out on these and it could be again like this rock pile here water as it cascades over this rock pile what will happen is you'll have two areas of slack water a lot of people don't understand this there's an area a bigger area of slack water on the back side of this rock you know where that current's flowing over the rock so obviously anything can sit in that part of the current but you know where your big and your active fish typically sit they're typically on the front side of that so you've got this rock pile on the front side of it where that water begins to act where it has to push over there's a sweet spot there where those fish can sit and they don't even have to do anything it's similar to uh those guys down in georgia there's some rivers down there where you'll see them they'll be surfing an endless wave that's what i imagine those fish are doing on the front sides of these big boulders these big bridge pylons and things like that there's an endless wave that they kind of surf and that's one of the key areas you can find now another thing when you have a lot of current coming out of the lake so let's say that we're running you know a normal amount of current what will happen is along these edges so you got these steeper banks that are coming down through here they'll still be as this water transitions from the deeper to the shallower on that transition that 45 transition there and especially where there's areas that bump out what will happen is the current will act upon that transition and actually create like we talked about before an eddy where that water will actually be pushing against the current close to the bank and it'll be pushing with the current as you get out to the end the break wherever that break is on that river edge there so if we zoom in here on that break you'll see that that's where a lot of times that that mix is and those fish sit on that now as the current there's less and less current that mix is further and further out and it's less powerful and so it doesn't really affect the position of the fish but the more current you have, it tightens that seam up. So in other words, it pushes the slack water, it pushes that comfortable water much, much closer to the bank. And so what you'll end up having, and it's a lot stronger too, in other words, the up current push. So when they're running a whole lot of current, you'll actually see um, items and bait fish getting pushed very quickly back towards the dam. Then they get dumped and back down and they get this endless cycle. And those fish, they'll sit right on that little sweet spot on that transition current break right there. And they'll pick those bait off. And so the high higher the current is, a lot of times the better that particular bite can be down through there. Again, another current break area, you know, you're looking at a rock pile here, that kind of area, you know, current's got to flow through that. So those can be great areas to target those big smallmouth, big spotted bass. And a lot of times you'd be surprised how heavy a current those largemouth will sit into. Now we're talking about things that are invisible. These are things that you can look at ahead of time and kind of know where fish should be sitting. And you'll even see these out on the river. If the, the hump kind of comes high up, you'll be able to see the disturbance on the water and know that there's something under there creating you know an area that you can target those fish in the current on there but one thing you can't discount at all is the the man-made things when you're coming down through here so these bridge pilings you know bridge pilings down here any kind of man-made structure down through here i think there's a lot of docks down through here as you get further down towards chattanooga here you get more and more 
you know, you got the big island there. You got all these bridges. You got all these marina type docks, barge ties and things like that. You can't discount any of that because it can be tremendous for holding a lot of fish. So look for the visible things that you can see. Um, the big laydowns that come way out into the water where they create a, a current break can be fantastic. You know, just a big boulder. When you're going down a do-nothing bank, maybe there's just a big boulder right there on a transition. That could be fantastic as well. River fishing is a very visual thing, just like we talked about before. It's fast-paced. It's very visual, and you cover a ton of water. So you can go down and fish these areas multiple times throughout a day because you got to think about, depending on the amount of current running down through there, you might be pushing down this thing at three, four, five miles an hour, and you're just controlling your drift with that trolling motor. So you're making fire and really quick, accurate casts with those short rods in there. It can be just fantastic for that. But I hope this map study helps you guys. If you have any more questions, feel free to leave them down in the comment section. Um, I've got some more videos related to this coming down the pipe. And of course, as we start transitioning into summer here, we're going to start talking about some of this ledge fishing on the upper lake here, how the current affects it. But it's very similar. If you learn this river fishing, if you learn how to fish small trout streams and stuff like that, it's all going to roll over on just a little bit bigger scale. And you'll be able to visualize what you're doing over there. And so that you can present that bait right in front of those fish the way you need to present it. All right, guys, congratulations. You made it to the end. You got to see the awesome fish catches. You saw the teaching. You saw the map study. Now you're here at the end. Thank you for watching. As always, make sure you like, subscribe to the channel, share this video with your friends. I want to get this information out there. I think it's really good information, that's good, but it's also going to roll over into most of your other Tennessee River ledge fishing and other techniques. So hope you see the value in that. I'll catch you on the next episode. As always, I hope this week finds you out on the water and I'll catch you there.